All right, so uh, if this is your first week, just to let you know, uh, again, my name is Pastor Michael. Uh, we have been in a series on Ephesians called Courage is Calling, and this is the last day, so we're going to wrap it up today before we get into the Christmas lessons and the kids singing outside and all the fun stuff, but um, just kind of going over this, this, this series you know, we call the, you know, courage is calling. And it's the idea that God wants us all to have these moments of courage, that it's okay to be scared. It's okay to be frightened. That's a natural, the body reacts that way. But God's also called us to stand in courage. And on that first week, I told you that we need to have courage to know that God is walking next to us, right? That was almost the, the cheat code of the whole series because that's it. We just need to know that God is walking next to us. And then another way to have courage, because I talked about like we all, you know, for guys, I think we all watch those movies and we want those moments of courage. We think it's easy like, oh yeah, I will, I will die, to my, die for my wife. But, but if she asks you ask to wash the dishes, it's like, uh, I don't know. I'm tired. Right? So courage looks different right? Like the, what God's called us to, to actually to do for courage. So then we talked about how just being unified as a body and, and getting along with people that we don't want to get along with, with or that, that bug us or bother us or, or just even being unified and think that that takes courage because that takes work. It's a lot easy to not be unified, right? It's a lot easy to, to be on your own and, and, to, and to point and to, and to make fun of. That's easy. But courage takes unity. And then we talked about uh, having unity in your giftings. We talked about how God has given us all our giftings and that, that, there, that there's things in us that he has, he has put in us so that we can advance his kingdom, stuff that we enjoy, stuff that, that uh, you know, we can make the most of. But it takes courage to do that because Why? We could be scared to fail at those giftings, right? We need courage to walk in those giftings, know that they are God-given for a reason. Yes, should we practice them? Yes, should we always get better at them? Yes, but, but know that we are naturally gifted at certain things. Have courage to walk in your giftings because we need it. And the last week we talked about the courage of Christ-like living, right? Our biggest, the biggest evangelist you can be is being the same person you are at church, than you are in the workplace, than you are at home, than you are with your spouse. Christ-like living, that takes courage because it's a lot easier to not. I think we all know that. I think we've all been put in situations where it's just a lot easier to go with the flow, but have courage to, be, to make those stands and say, no, that's not how I live. That's not how I want my family to live kind of call to a higher calling. So it takes courage to do those things. And so I ask us, why? Why must we all have courage? Why must we do these things? And it all comes down to Ephesians 5. Again, it says that be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most every opportunity because the days are evil. Again, you can turn on your television. You can look at the news. You can see. The days are evil. That's why God has called each and every one of you to take up the stand to be courageous, to be in unity, to be in Christ-like living, to use your giftings, to know that he's with you. Have courage. All right, so now we get into it. If you've grown up in the church, you probably have heard this sermon. I have done this sermon with little kids. I have done, not this exact sermon, but I have taught this story with little kids, with the youth group. It's all about the armor of God, right? Now we have talked about throughout all Ephesians. Let me remind you that this was a, this was a, a letter that Paul wrote to a congregation, to a people that he loved dearly. He spent two years with these people, ministering side by side with them. He knew the area. He knew what they were up against. Some of the most, you know, demonic oppression. But yet, 
God was able to prevail. He changed the whole landscape of this city, changed the economy for the good. People started getting rid of their idols, started, you know, completely changing for God. And so he loved these people. He had to leave. He ends up being in, in, you know, getting arrested in Rome. He's sitting there and he's writing to these people. And again, all the Ephesian is like, have courage for this. Have courage for that. Keep doing this. Keep doing this. And here's the why. Because you are in a fight. You are in a war. You are in a battle. This is why you have to do this. And so today, we need courage to unify. We need courage for, to walk in our giftings. We need courage to have Christ's life living. But we also need the courage to fight. Amen. To fight back. It's talk, it talks about, you know, where we go up against the gates of hell. The gates are a defensive posture. So God's t- telling us we need to go on the offensive. Attack. Amen. Because why? The days are evil. The days are evil. So finally, we're at the moment. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Ephesians 6. And we're going to start at 10. This, he just gets done talking about instructions for how to love your wife or how to love your spouse, how to treat your children how to act in the workplace. Again, he's, that's kind of like the, the areas of everybody's life, relationships, uh, you know, workplace, school, how you are to act. Do it in such a manner like, like this. And then he gets finally to, to verse 10, and it says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Again, he's writing to them. To be honest, he's probably writing to them something they don't already know. They know how hard it is in Ephesus. They know what they're doing. But he's reminding them, like, look, I want to kind of shift the focus on who your enemy is and how you are to fight them. Okay? So now it's time to suit up. But there's a couple things about before you even suit up that's a mindset that he wants them to have, okay? Sorry, that sounded weird. (laughs) First thing is this. When he says, finally, be strong and stand in the Lord, he's reminding them that it's not about avoiding the battle, but it's standing in it. Okay, you're, 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 not, you're, not, you're not avoiding the fight. You're already in it. I can remember very clearly the first fight I ever got into as a kid. And, I, well, I don't remember why we did. Who knows? Um, probably over Pogs. <laughs> I don't know. Probably it wasn't Pogs. Those of you guys remember Pogs. Anyways, uh, but I remember being in the office with the principal. I remember him calling my mom, and you only hear the one-sided conversation. You only hear the principal telling the story, and then you just, you, you're, you're, your mind is racing. Crap, what's going to happen? What's going to go on? My mom picks me up. I start crying because I know I'm in trouble. She takes me. We get in the car, and she says, well, uh, go to your room. And uh, we will talk when your dad gets home. I'm done for. I, I, I love a Christmas story because that scene is so perfect when he gets into that fight and then he has to wait and then he's so scared and he's waiting and he's waiting. And you just know. And, and I, man, I, I, I can remember just the sound of my dad's old Ford. You can hear it coming down the street. That do 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 getting closer and closer and closer. And he had his keys on his on his hip, and you could just hear it again. It just reminded me of like an old western with spurs coming to the door, <laughs> opening the door, and hey, you know, how's it going? And I'm in my room, and then my mom comes gets me and goes, "All right, we're we're going to talk to you now." 
And so we're sitting at the table. My dad's sitting at the table. I'm not looking at him. My head is down. I am scared. I am terrified. I don't know what's going to be, you know, what's going to happen to me. And we're sitting at the table. And my mom says, okay, son, I want to talk. we want to talk to you. And she goes to tell me about how I should conduct myself at school, about fighting. And she says, look, I want you to know, like, like, like you, you, if you can avoid the fight, she said, it's not about the fight, son. She said, if, if you can avoid the fight, walk away. You know, go tell a teacher. You know, but she's, but, but, but I know you need to defend yourself, but you can never throw the first punch. You can never, never do this. And, and, and just know that, that, you know, we love you, and, 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 but, but you need to do whatever you can to never fight again. I'm not looking at my dad. My dad is stone quiet. Just my head down. I'm like, okay, mom. All right. She goes, okay. Are you are you okay, Michael? I'm like, yeah, okay. Thinking, okay, maybe I'm gonna get, maybe I'm gonna survive this after all. She goes, okay. All right. Well, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be grounded. I just, we just don't want this to happen again. Okay. Great. Whew. And then my dad spoke up. He said, "All right, uh, Terry, I'm gonna take Michael into the garage now." my little starts to quiver we go into the garage and there I'm surrounded there's something magical about a garage there's you know there's it's 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 his world right it's there's motorcycles there's parts there's tools there's you know uh camping equipment from from memories I'm trying to hold on to at this time of 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 horribleness and 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 you know little stupid things I made for him for Father's Day and realizing, like, that's a stupid gift. I should have given him something better hanging on his wall. And he sits me on the, on, the, on the bench and he says, son, everything your mom said is true. But... Okay. And that's when I looked at him. He said, but I know, son that there are going to be fights that you're not going to be able to walk away from. That there are going to be fights that you're, you're going to have to act first. He says, yes, avoid at all costs. But son, I know that there's going to be a day that you're going to have to stand your ground and do what you need to do. And I'll never forget that. And that's the same thing that God wants to remind us. We can say that we want to avoid the devil all we want, right? Like, it's silly. Like, if we want to avoid the devil and we go into a room and we see a bunch of people heads spinning around and, like, weird devil tongues and babies crawling on the the ceiling, we're like, we're out. I'm avoiding that. (laughs) Not going there today. But you know where the devil works? It's in a cold marriage. It's in your uh, broken relationships with your kids, broken relationships at work, misunderstandings at work. It's the things that we don't really think is going to happen. That, that's where the devil's working at you. And we can't avoid that. We have to stand in it. Because so again, it's not about the avoiding the battle. It's, it's about standing in it. Look, and I know, I mean, some of you, I know your stories I know what's going on right now in your lives, and some of you know what's going on in ours. Like we, there's times where we just feel beat up, and it's tiring, and it hurts. And again, the Bible is, it doesn't teach us how to avoid pain. It teaches us how to stand in it, because pain's inevitable. Right. It's hard to say, but it, it, it is. So again, this, this is not about avoiding the battle. It's about standing in it. The second thing, if you don't know that you're in a battle, then you've already lost. Amen. You're, you're losing currently. I think we do, a, we do such a great job as a church, and I'm not speaking this church, but just America church, um, doing evangelism and getting people to, to accept Christ and to do you know, all those things and and even upstairs with the kids. But, but there is a second half to things that we don't necessarily talk about, right? Like, can you imagine being up there with kids and being like, look, kids, 
Do you want Jesus to be your forever friend, to live in your heart and to, to be with you constantly and to love you and to accept you? And kids are like, yeah, that sounds great. And then, yeah, and you're going to be saved and you're going to go into heaven. And, and, and then that's when, like, the hands go up. My dog died a couple weeks ago. Is he going to be in heaven? And I'm like, uh-huh. but you're going to be in heaven. Right? Do you want that? And they're like, yeah, I'm in. Let's go. And we pray. But what we don't do is say, okay, now look, kids. Now you have an enemy. Now you have an enemy that hates you and is going to do whatever they, he can to destroy your life. He's going to put so much doubt in your head that everyone hates you. And as you get older, that enemy is going to tell you that the sin you're involved in, you're the only one. You're the only one and you have all the shame. And we don't do that. I don't know if we're going to get many takers if that's the case. And then when the kid says, well, well, what's the devil like? Oh, he's like a lion. He's like a lion that, you know, rips, rips and tears at other things. That's in stocks. That, that's how it is. <laughs> Look, I tell you, like, I've been a pastor for, for a long time. I've been a youth pastor. I've worked in children's ministries. I've had these conversations. And you know what? You know what's interesting? I was not prepared the first time for my own kids to have that conversation about an enemy. Like, it completely took me off guard. Like, oh, wow, I, I got to tell them this. They love church. They love going up there. Pastor Sarah does a great job in providing an environment. But as my kids are getting older, we'd explain to them spiritual warfare. I, I was not prepared for that. H- how do I do this? But I had to. Look, God is sovereign. God is in control. But when I read things like 1 John, it says that we know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. And again, turn on the news. It very much shows that. Yes, is God all-powerful? Yes. Is God sovereign? Yes. Did something happen when Adam and Eve sinned that gave you know, dominion to the enemy? Yeah. And we ask, well, why isn't God doing something about this? Why isn't God just ending it and, and, and just taking us all to heaven right now? Well, there's a loved one. There's a friend that you know that he's still waiting on. That's right. Amen. Mm-hmm. But the enemy is very much around. He is very much in our lives in our cities, everywhere, in your work. So if you don't know that you're in a battle, you've already lost. Here's the other thing. If you don't know your enemy, you're already defeated. Look, I know like, there's, there's, a, there's a culture shift in churches that we don't really like to, to talk about it because we like to say, oh, we're glorifying the enemy even if we talk about him. And I don't think that's the case. I think there's a, there's a, there's a difference between worshiping and glorifying and versus, the, versus getting to know our enemy. And the Bible says it right here. Who is our enemy? It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the heavenly... I'm sorry and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Okay? That is your enemy. Rulers, authorities, and powers of this dark world. It ain't people. It's not your ex. It's not your boss. It's not your school bully. No, those are captives. No, your enemy is the devil. And we need to recognize that. So we need to know who is the real enemy here. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right, next. The last thing. Well, not the last thing, but... Is that to know your king and who you fight with and who you fight and what you fight for. Knowing what we fight for is so important, right? 
if someone was to put me like in a boxing match or the octagon or just some sort of death circle, I don't know. And they said, hey, look, fight for, uh, fight this person. Well, what, do you, what am I fighting for? 75 cents. All right. As soon as the guy takes one step at me, I'm just going to fall to the ground. Because 75 cents ain't worth it. Someone says, well, for your wife and for your kids, I might last a little longer because now I know who I'm fighting for. Right? So in this world, in spiritual warfare, who are you fighting for? You could say yourself, absolutely. If you have family, your family, your friends, your friends. But know who you're fighting for and know that the king is with you. Like I said in that first week, know the God that walks beside you. Have the courage to get to know them. Know him, sorry. All right. So that's our enemy. We need to take a stand. What do we do? So then Paul writes, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. It doesn't say, you know, if the day of evil comes. It says when the day of evil comes, stand your ground. And after you have everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. How many of you guys have heard that before? Yeah, we, it's been around. Sorry. (laughs) That's cleaner this time. So let's talk about that. Let's break that down. All right. Let's start. It starts with the belt of truth. I tried to, you know, I saw Pastor Mandy's sermon. She had the the puzzle and I'm like, well, I'm going to do something. I'm going to show her up. So I got this stuff. I don't have a, a belt, though, but I want to talk about what that is, the belt of truth, what that was. And so it was this physical reminder that the soldier was a soldier. It was the one thing that when they strapped that thing on, they knew they were doing one thing and one thing only, and that was being a soldier. When they would take it off, that's when they would rest and be at ease and be more comfortable and just be a normal Roman. But when he puts that belt on, he knew it was, it was go time. Not only that, but that belt also, it strapped everything else together. It held, it held the girdle. It held the, the, the breastplate. So that thing had to go on first because it held all the other pieces together. And so when it says belt of truth, again, as Paul is sitting in jail and he sees his Roman guards, and he's, God is just saying, look at this. This is what you need. This is the word picture I want. Write it down. It's going to be a good Bible. And so he does and he's writing it down. It's okay, belt, belt of truth, right? Everything starts with truth. We have to believe at the bare minimum that there is a God that has created us and that there is a God who became flesh, who died for our sins, right? If you, you, you might have a hard time believing in Noah or Jonah or walking on water. Okay, we'll get there. But know the basics of truth first. If you don't get that, you are not going to last. That is the number one thing you have to have wrapped around your waist so that everything else, because everything else hangs on God, Jesus, dying for our sins. Everything else hangs on that. Right? Get that first. All right. The second thing, breastplate of righteousness. This is where my first prop comes in. It's very uh, convincing. Uh, or not convincing. It's very nice that we have living nativity at this point of the year for this lesson. It wasn't hard for me to have to go in and dig all this stuff out. But the breastplate of righteousness, it protected The soldier's most vital organs, heart, liver, lungs, all that stuff, all the important stuff right here. You can get stabbed in the arm. You can still be an effective fighter, right? But here, 
you're done for, right? And this is what it protected. It protects here. And God says it's righteousness. More importantly, it's his righteousness. Okay? I don't know. Maybe you know. Maybe you don't. But I don't look like this (laughs) under this. All right? This is my righteousness. This is God's righteousness. Okay? When you walk, this is how we are to envision ourselves, not because of who we are, but because God, we wear God's righteousness. I go into battle like this. No. I go into battle with this. They're going to be like, oh, dang. Yeah. God's righteousness. Not mine. That is so important because we cannot do anything. Our righteousness on our best day is filthy rags. But with God's righteousness, we are something totally different. Totally different. Okay? Our righteousness is never good enough, but his is. And yet, it it, it weighs. It's not a comfortable thing to wear. And the enemy will convince us that we don't need it, that you'll be fine without it. You can go into battle without it. You're fine. You'll move faster. You'll do things. No. He's just convincing you that he wants your most vital organs opened up. The next thing, sandals of readiness. All right? So a lot of times it was this, uh, I've heard this message. They're saying like, oh, oh, yeah, this this gives us the ability to evangelize. And I don't think that's what it is. Because when, when he's looking at this, when, 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 when Paul is looking at, at these sandals, and again, this, is, this was a technological advancement. All right? Because what they did is they had these leather sandals, they put these tacks at the bottom, which would like a cleat, right? This is how Alexander conquered the known world. This is how Rome was able to do things and get across vast areas so quickly that other nations didn't even have a chance because they protected their feet. They were sure-footedness. In battle, they weren't barefoot. They were holding to Those little tacks they put in the leather would keep them to stand. Okay? So what, what is it with, with that? We have to have sure footing, and our stability is found in that gospel, right? Life's going to come at us for a lot of different reasons, for for whatever, good things, bad things, it's coming at us, but we have the good news, which is the gospel. That is our sure footing. That's going to cause us from stumbling, from falling over, knowing that the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins to make a way for us. Sure footing, sandals. All right, next thing, shield of faith. Very cool. Now, if there's any, like, historians out there, don't talk to me, but this is just all I had. Okay. All right. So a shield protects us from the fiery arrows of the enemy, right? So bow and arrows was a great way to have warfare. It would destroy armies until someone created the shield and was able to catch those arrows. Then the next thing was, well, why don't we just light the arrows on fire? So it burns the shields, right? Well, the Romans, they were able to do these things where they put like leather on their shields. They started protecting their shields so that the fiery darts would stop. But those fiery darts come nonetheless. And they come faster than you think. All right? How many of you think you can dodge a bow and arrow? I've tried. Like at one of those, we had an arrow thing in here one time. It was crazy. I did not dodge it. Um, it. They come fast. And sometimes you don't know how to process and how to think. And the only thing that we have to hold on to is our faith that we can just hide behind. Look, panic will happen. There will be times that we panic. And I'm not saying panic's okay, but I'm, a, I'm saying it's okay that you panicked. 
Okay? But the shield of faith, sometimes that's all we can do is just hold on and hide behind. Like, look, I just have my faith. I don't have all the answers. I don't want to know what's going to happen to us tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen to that medical condition or to our finances. But what I do have, I have my faith. Shield of faith keeps us secure. Um, all right, next thing. Helmet of salvation. Next time I go to a USC game, I should take this. <laughs> they think I'm so cool. No, this is another thing that's kind of hard to wear. I'm not going to put it on. Well, no, I'm not going to do it. It hurts. Anyways. So the helmet of salvation protects the most essential part for a soldier, right? Again, you would not go into battle with it. Our armies today still wear helmets, right? Are they comfortable? No. But would you be caught dead in a battle without them? No, you wouldn't. They're not in the middle of a battle or in the middle of a fight and taking it off. Be like, oh, this is so hot. (laughs) Take it off. They're like, no, I need to be secure in this. I need this on. I need to know that my standing with the God of the universe is okay because you will have an enemy that will constantly convince you that you need to keep doing things to earn your salvation, that you need to do this, you need to do that. You're not good enough. This secures your thought process like, no, it's for God that loves me. I serve a God that only had to die once. I serve a God that only wants me to accept his son and that free gift. I don't need to do all these things. This secures your relationship with him, your helmet of salvation. I don't have a sword. I wish I did. Well, I couldn't find them. But, you know, swords, they're cool. Um, The last thing is a sword, the attacking weapon of the soldier. There is nothing more powerful than the Word of God. There's nothing more powerful than this right here. However, you got to learn how to use it. Amen. Right? Look, if you've never heard this before, then I want to say this right now. I do apologize. But there's been a lot of bad things that have happened because people use this incorrectly throughout all history. And if you're one of them, if you're one of them that was ever involved in something where someone threw this at you in such a way that, that, that caused you to have a, a wrong view of God or a young, wrong view of the church, then beha- on behalf of, of all Christians, I, I, I want to say sorry. Because there are so many people that have abused this and has used it as a weapon, but did not use it correctly. So if you have this, learn to use it because it is the most powerful thing. When Jesus was confronted with the enemy in the desert, that's all Jesus did was use this. And we have that same power to do exactly what he did against the enemy. We can do it. All right, so there it is. There's the armor now we have it. What do we do with it? How do we use it? Let's, verse 18 says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. That's our armor. But how do we use it? And how do we fight? Is that. I'm going to read that one more time. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So the first thing, pray in the Spirit. It's aligning with Him. Right? There might be things that we need to pray for that God wants us to do that we just don't want to do it. But we need to align ourselves with him. 
Not our prayers, but his prayers. It's putting away our pride and what we want for what he wants, for his will. The second thing is, on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests for the Lord's people, being comprehensive prayers, pray for everything, you are in any way, You can have quiet prayers. You can have loud prayers. You can have prayers with people. You can be praying alone. You can have groaning prayers. You can have prayers of celebration. It doesn't matter. Just pray. Constantly pray. Just pray in all things. That's what communicating with God is. That's the most important thing. And look, look, there might be people out there that look, well, you know, I try to pray, and don't get me wrong, it's hard. So hard, in fact, that when we meet as leaders sometimes, and I say, all right, who wants to pray? It's still crickets. <laughs> Just like the youth group, when I ask them. Just like, actually, you know, the little kids are really on it. Like, I'll do it, and they kind of fight for it. But something happens from that transition to all of a sudden, oh, I don't want to do it. I get it. Praying is hard. For me, I'd be praying for something, and all of a sudden, squirrel. Start thinking of something else. It just happens. It's it. it, it, You have to work at it, okay. But don't be someone that just prays when it's hard. If you're someone that's just like, well, I, I really only pray when it's when it's when it's rough, and I need prayer. Well, then maybe the tactic of the enemy is what he's gonna do. He's gonna make your life pretty good. Because he doesn't want you communicating with God. If you only pray when life is rough, well, he's going to do his best to make life easy for you. I don't want you communicating with the enemy. Comprehensive. Just pray. Pray, pray. Pray for others. Again, it's just like soldiers. You're fighting for the person next to you. Pray for your family. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for the people in this church. Pray for others, because we need it. Another thing, it says that be alert, be proactive. Like I said, Satan's a lion. He's a stalking lion that you're not going to see coming until it's too late, if you're not paying attention. Keep your head on a swivel. Look. And then there are times where I can wake up, and I don't know what to pray for. I just say, God, go before me today, because I don't know what today has planned. I don't know what the enemy is going to throw at me today. Have you ever had that day where you just maybe woke up and it was a great day, but you come home that night and you're like, I've just been destroyed. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Things changed like that. There's, been, there's ambushes for you. There's ambushes being set for you. So be alert. Be proactive. And just say at the very least, God, go before me today because I don't know what today holds. Fourth thing is keep, always keep praying, being persistent. And that's when I said, like, look, praying is hard work. It's not easy. I'll be the first to admit it. I know that sometimes we hear people that make it sound like it's the most eloquent and beautiful thing. And I'm like, I could never speak like that. But it's still hard. And when I say you need the courage to fight, this is what I mean creating a daily habit to pray because the days are evil. Okay? All right, if I can have the band come on up. And if, as the band comes up, they can grab me a communion thing because I forgot. Um, so the first couple games of this season... Oh, thanks, Mike. Um, first couple games of the season, I thought I was done for. We won, but we won by sheer luck. Like, I'll be honest. Like, sometimes there's luck in sports that you could just be like, wow, we, that really, we really skated by, really. And I even had parents come up to me and be like, well, well coach, you know, that was, you guys barely won that one. I'm like, you think? Thanks, man. And I'd go back into practice and with the kids and their junior hires, and, they're, and there's a level of that. I got to allow for a junior hire to be a junior hire. But there's also a level of like, look, 
what type of season do you want? Do you want to win? Or do you want to just play football for the fun of it? Because I can be either or. And they're like, oh, we want to win. I'm like, yeah, of course you do. That's why we play this game. We want to win. I said, look, we practice sometimes the same play over and over and over and over. Right? And they get mad. They're like, oh, why do we keep doing the same thing? Oh, we want to do the long throws. We want to do the glory stuff. I said, no, I know you guys can do that. We need to keep practice the same small things over and over and over. And they would get so mad, they would, they would pout. They would be like, Aah. I'm like, look, whatever. Finally, I, I kind of had it. I said, all right. I said, let me ask you guys a question. So we're going up against Ramona. Ramona Junior High and Lover. It's kind of like our rivals. And um, I said, let me ask you guys a question. Do you, do you think Ramona is practicing harder than you right now? Or do you think you're practicing harder than them? I said, because that's who's going to win this game. And from that day on, something clicked in them. Something completely changed their focus. They were now, now, they, now they, were, they were kids coming out to practice, wanting to do the small things. Not the big glory things, but the small things that make a complete football team. And I say that because I think that's how spiritual warfare works too. Like we have rulers and principalities and all these things coming at us. What, who is practicing harder? Is it you, Christian? Are you praying harder than these principalities are working against you? There's something to think about. So regardless, like I said, it's a bummer. It really is a bummer that the days are evil. We're not in heaven yet. Okay? God knows that, but God just wants us to stand. So have courage to stand. Amen? Amen. All right, well, let's get into communion. I just got done watching all the Lord of the Rings movies with my kids. It was so awesome. And I love those giant battles and the the speeches that happen before it, right? It just gets you, and you're just like, I just want to stand up after watching the movie. Like, yeah, let's do this. I want to be in the movie with them because it gets you, inspires you. So just want to move forward. And I started thinking, like, man, one of the greatest speeches ever told was when Jesus got up, that final, that final push to the cross. And said, like, this is what all of history has been leading towards. That this is the darkest before the dawn. This is the darkest they will ever get. And he is with his disciples. And he's telling them, like, look, we're going to have communion now. Because I get it. It, it, You don't know it, but it's going to get bad. It's going to get dark. But this is it. This is the victory. And so because Jesus died on the cross, because he willingly gave up his body, we have victory over illness, over finances. I'm having a heck of a time right now. My catalytic converter We have victory over something as silly as that. Because he gave up his body. So take this now remembering that because he gave up his body, we have victory. All right. Not only do we have victory... We have been reconciled with God, not just forgiven, but we have been reconciled with God. Brought forth back into relationship because of the blood that he shed, the perfect blood that he shed on the cross. We have been reconciled. So take this now in remembrance, the blood that he shed brought us back with God.
All right. I'm just going to wrap this up. And I'm just going to go into it. Meaning I'm not going to come back up here. All right. I want to pray for you. Church, have courage. Like I talked about a lot of dark things. That, yeah, there is an enemy. He's out there. He is trying to rip and to tear you apart. He is trying to divide your families. He's trying to ruin your marriage. He's trying to get your kids to hate you. He's trying to get you fired from a job because of misunderstandings. There are so many little small things, and I'm sorry if that, if, if that scares you. But if that scares you, then you've missed the point. Because have courage. The battle is already, is already over. All these little things, these little ticky-tack things, it's, it's his last stand because this is all he's got. Because he can't hurt the father, he's going to hurt the kids. Right? So have courage. The battle is over. The minute we choose to stand, the minute we choose to have courage to fight with that armor of God on, We've won. Not because of us, but because of him. Because Jesus, God, has only asked us, all you need to do is stand. Just stand. That is your part. He takes care of the rest. So, Heavenly Father, we ask that we just be with us all this week as we get into this Christmas time. I ask, Lord, that you for healing and that none of us are sick during this time. That we're able to to. Uh, have that courage to reconcile relationships with family members during this time, Lord. That there's nothing that, that, that should separate us from, from our families during this time. So give us that courage, Lord, to do that. Father, we thank you. And Lord Church, remember you have victory. Remember you've already won. So let me, Lord, bless and keep you. May cause his face to shine upon you. And walk out today after this song looking at a fellow soldier in armor that is fighting the fight of this courage. Amen? Amen. All right, have a great week.